Man was reaching for the stars, but nature intervened. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, yesterday you did a live broadcast as we record this today on, what is this, Thursday now, the 28th? Um, mm -hmm. On yep. Wednesday, the 27th, SpaceX got everything lined up on uh, Launch Pad 39 at Cape Canaveral uh, to prepare for the first manned launch on the Falcon 9 rocket in the Dragon capsule headed for the International Space Station. And, and that didn't go off as planned. But you had an opportunity to do a live broadcast in the moments leading up to the final decision to scrub the launch just a few minutes before its scheduled takeoff. Um, and I wanted to just today get your impressions on what you saw. What I saw yesterday was one of the most resounding successes in the history of the space program. Wow, that's, that's um, what, quite a claim. No, I mean it. Uh, what what I saw yesterday was the successful test of uh, of the emergency system that could have saved uh, the crews of Apollo One, uh, the three men on Apollo One could have saved the, the crews on Challenger, and you could certainly make the case that it could have saved the crews on Columbia as well. What we saw yesterday was a successful test of the ability of engineers to withstand enormous social pressure. Uh, the hype around the SpaceX launch was uh, enormous and well-deserved. And the when you have that many people, forget the people on the pad, forget your controllers, forget the people who came down to SpaceX, the crowd out there that's that's waiting and cheering, and especially forget um, the, the, uh, the, I don't want to say anxiety, I think that's underselling uh, the astronauts, but certainly the, the uh, emotional focus of, of those guys. All of that stuff is on the line. Um, and conditions were certainly not good, but they it wasn't like there was a hurricane blowing either. Uh, when they called off that launch because things just didn't look right, I just said, okay, this attitude, if this attitude remains, then SpaceX is not only gonna go to Mars, they're gonna be the first people on Mars because that that bowing to social pressure is what rushed uh, the Apollo 1 capsule, which was a complete catastrophe. The design of the original Apollo capsule uh, prior to the redesign after the Apollo 1 fire, it was a complete dog. Um, and, and for those uh, and of Gus you Grissom, who, who, uh, who didn't grow up in the generation that Bill and I did, the Apollo 1 capsule caught fire inside and all three of the astronauts uh, died in that fire. Yes, and um, and we had the Merc Mercury program, which was very successful, the Gemini program, which was spectacularly successful. The Apollo program was going to go right after that. They had a capsule that at the time that they took delivery, I want to say had something like 500 plus technical squawks, 500 individual listings of things wrong with that capsule. And Gus Grissom, uh, the second American in space who was uh, on that flight, hung a lemon from his um, from his backyard on the simulator. Uh, and not long after that, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee uh, died in a fire on board that capsule due to an electrical short circuit because of the shoddy construction. But they pushed it anyway because, because they had a timetable to meet and, and expectations and pressures were very high. Challenger launched on a day uh, that was not only the coldest launch in shuttle history, but was also the day with by far the largest amount of wind shear. That's why if you look at the 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 uh, the very famous video of the Challenger explosion, you'll see that the smoke trail from the solid rocket boosters is really badly bent. The, the, the craft took an awful lot of vibration on the way up. The engineers said it was too cold. They said, you can't launch this thing, but it was America's first teacher in space and there'd been delays before and the president uh, wanted to see the launch and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm quite sure that Ronald Reagan didn't say launch this thing today regardless of the conditions, but the social pressure on the people making the go, no go decisions was enormous. And, and the same was the case yesterday, enormous. And when you see the system work as well as it did, I would have rather seen that launch called off in less than perfect, but flyable conditions. I would have rather seen that than seen the escape tower work after, at, uh, on launch with them whisking the astronauts safely away and as the rocket exploded. I, I'm not worried about that. We haven't lost, um, 
We haven't lost any astronauts to rocket explosions. Uh, you may say that we lost a, uh, the, the Challenger to a rocket explosion, but we didn't. We knew that was coming. We knew there were O-ring burnouts on previous flights. We knew it was too cold to fly. We knew it was too turbulent to fly, but we flew anyway. And we lost that vehicle and those seven people because of the inability of, of the people in control to say, not today. And that test, that enormous safety test was passed yesterday, I thought, with flying colors. Now, Bill, uh, you know more about this certainly than I do, way more. Um, you are the author and uh, narrator of the four-part series on Apollo 11, What We Saw, which folks can find at BillWhittle.com. There's a banner at the top of the page where you can click on that. Uh, but what interests me is this interplay between SpaceX and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Um, who ultimately held the power of, of go or no-go? in this situation. Do you know that? Uh, I don't know for an absolute certain fact, but I bet, bet pretty much the entire farm on the fact that it was SpaceX. In fact, I, I, I cannot imagine a world where it was NASA. I cannot. It, it must have been SpaceX. I don't remember the name of the, of the uh, launch director who made the decision, but it certainly must have been SpaceX. Uh, and, and by the way, this brings up a, a particularly interesting and important point, and that is the relationship of the role of uh, with NASA and the actual people that are flying in the vehicles and, and building the hardware. In, in the days of the uh, Space Race Mark I, uh, NASA was coordinating an enormous national effort and NASA's primary job was to basically get together, say what we need, parcel those, uh, those hardware requirements out to thousands of contractors, including major ones like North American and Grumman and, and Boeing and, and IBM and so on. So NASA Coordinate was like a GC things. in this instance. They were a general Yes, that's contractor. precisely correct. Precisely correct. That's, that's exactly the way to think of it. And that was the, tr the case of NASA from Mercury all the way up through uh, the end of Apollo with Apollo Soyuz. Once we got into the space shuttle, NASA became more like an airline. Uh, it, it became more like TWA or, or Pan Am. And you could see the de-evolution of, of safety standards and quality standards as time went on. They started to think, I never actually had this revelation before this exact moment, to be honest with you, I wish I had. Hmm. But, but during the, the long run of shuttle flights, it was 130 plus, I think. Over the course of that time, NASA was basically given vehicles and told fly these missions, build the space station and so on. And NASA began to develop the kind of mentality that, that people who are running a business for profit in a tough market make. They have to make the same decisions that airlines have to make in terms of, well, we certainly need some maintenance. And, and if we use all the maintenance that's available, we we will over-engineer the thing and, and, and go out of business. So how much do we use? And NASA started to behave like airline executives on, a, on an airline that was losing money, who couldn't afford to be late, who couldn't afford to have... Um, you know, delayed flights, their reputation was already suffering. We don't and have time to de-ice the wings again. Precisely correct. That's that perfect. You, 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 you have the Challenger disaster and, to, and a little more opaquely, the Columbia exast, uh, disaster in a sentence. We don't have time to de-ice the wings again. We got to get going. The flight's already late. Um, and, and this was catastrophic. That cost us 14 lives and, uh, and, and enormous, enormous loss all throughout the entire space program. And, and actually, the period of the space shuttle was when NASA began a very, very long decline, which I think probably reached its pinnacle under uh, President Obama when NASA was basically tasked to uh, go around to Muslim institutions and tell them how much uh, uh, Muslim science had contributed to uh, to the American space program, which may or may not be a worthy goal, but it's not the goal you want from the National Aeronautics and Space Program. Uh, and so my opinion of NASA continued to evolve. And throughout the early part of the 2000s, when Burt Rutan was flying, uh, the first private astronaut in space was not going to be these two guys on SpaceX. It was uh, first private citizen, first private astronaut was... Um, uh, was uh, launched on, on Burt Rutan's uh, flight in, I want to say it was in 2004. Mike Melville was the first civilian astronaut. But at that time in the early 2000s, a number of people who I knew in aerospace said that NASA's primary mission now is to make sure that nobody gets into space. It was like, it was like this horrible, horrible conglomeration of every Karen in the universe running the FAA and 
and, and absolutely crushing innovation. Now, with the new administrator, the new president, what NASA's job is openly stated by the new NASA director is to facilitate American spaceflight. What a novel idea mm. that is. So they're not the general contractor and they're not the airline manager. Now, they are the facilitator. They are the people that are responsible for where spaceflight interfaces with the American population. They have uh, some role to do, obviously, with safety inspection standards and all the rest of it, but they are no longer running the spaceflight program, micromanaging the day-to-day you know, minutia of, of launching people into space. Bill, it almost sounds and, to me like the varied interpretations of the Commerce Clause in the Constitution, where some people look at it and say the power to regulate commerce means to place rules and burdens upon the, that process of commerce. And when the original writers of it were basically thinking, well, we just want to make commerce regular. In, in other words, remove the barriers to free commerce. Boy, that's beautifully said. Beautifully said. Um, it, having written uh, uh, the Apollo 11, what we saw series, which was titled Apollo 11, but it was basically the entire space race soup to nuts. There is a strange sort of a uh, paradox. Uh, it bothers some people more than it bothers me, but nevertheless, it seems to be true that, that the Apollo program, culmination of Mercury and Gemini, and finally landing on the moon with the Apollo program, was in a sense a very un-American enterprise to the degree that it was all essentially coordinated by and funded by the state. It it was something that the U.S. government wanted to do, needed to do, and that the American people were behind, and the government spent government money on it to get there. And when public interest began to wane, congressional support for it began to wane. And if you ever want to know the measure of a greatness of a country, all you have to do is look at America in the 1970s. We're the only nation in the history of the world that got bored with going to the moon. That's exactly (laughs) what happened. Um, And and then as the shuttle program uh, uh, continued on, Prior to the actual construction, Congress, the original design for the space shuttle was extremely elegant. It was one giant jet that would fly the shuttle on top. It could take off from anywhere like LAX or Van Nuys Airport or something like that. Go up it into, um, into high uh, altitude, release the orbiter. Orbiter would go into space. It could land at any airport. You'd just refuel it and go. And over the course of a decade, as Congress continued to cut the budget for the shuttle program, the engineers had to say, okay, well, we can no longer afford the carrier jets, so now what the hell do we do? Well, we're gonna have to have an external fuel tank and we're gonna have to have solid rocket boosters and all of this stuff that they added onto the original design was the stuff that failed. It was the solid rocket boosters that destroyed Challenger and it, and it was foam coming off of the external tank that punched a hole in the wing of Columbia. But since we're dealing with SpaceX now and we're dealing with the private company, it's not even the it's not even the economic pressure, Scott. It's not it's not even that that the shuttle was on a budget. It's that because it was managed by Congress, that budget was never the same ever. Every year it was different, and almost always every year it was less. Since we're dealing with a company that's owned by an individual. He is going to determine how much funding is going to be in there. It's his interest to fund this thing at least adequately. And and the reason Elon Musk is going to get to Mars, and I think he's going to get there before anybody else, can be summed up in in a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting term he used. If you if you've seen the inside of the Dragon capsule, it looks nothing like anything that has ever flown in space before. Nothing like. You look at the inside of the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo capsules. Look at the inside of Soyuz. Look at the the flight deck on the on the space shuttles, and it and they've just wedged astronauts into the middle of all of these uh, analog instruments. We call them steam gauges in aviation. Now. The interior of of the Dragon capsule is voluminous. There's nothing but these, basically these carbon fiber arcs with these minimalist seats. And you could see from the spacesuits how simple they looked, just how how advanced they look. You look at at the launch yesterday and instead of 10,000 instruments and switches, you've got basically two touchscreen monitors. And, And the thing that is so important here And the reason that SpaceX is going to succeed is that when Elon Musk was talking about the inside of the capsule, he said, well, we want to be safe. We want to hold this many people and so on. And this is this is the difference. He said, and we want it to be beautiful. Hmm. Now, that 
is is an element that I am that I am quite convinced is a first in 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 aerospace history. I think it's certainly a, a first in space flight. We wanted to to do all of these things, and we want it to be beautiful. That's why this one is going to succeed. Uh, it's going to succeed because they didn't launch when they could have launched. And, it, and it's going to succeed because they want it to be beautiful. And, and even more than that, they want it to be fun. When they had to test the payload for the um, Falcon Heavy, uh, they could have just put, you know, hundreds of pounds of cement up in the nose cone, but they didn't. They launched a candy apple red Tesla convertible roadster. They put a mannequin called Starman in behind the wheel. They uh, played David Bowie when the fairing came off on the launch and uh, and the instrument panel on the navigation screen on the Tesla said, don't panic. Uh, the official name of that tiny little barge, that postage stamp that they're able to land on in the Atlantic Ocean. The official name of that vehicle is not, you know, RV3 for Recovery Vehicle 3. It's, it's actual genuine legal name is of course, I still love you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful to the members at BillWhittle.com who have made this program possible. Um, NASA has said that the earliest window that they could reattempt the launch would be uh, this coming Saturday, which will be a, a day after you see this video, theoretically, we'll if you watch there. it right away. Um, but whenever it goes up, uh, we will be there to report on it and to react to it. If you have not yet seen Bill's Apollo 11, What We Saw series, go to BillWhittle.com and click the banner at the top of the page, and that'll take you to a place where you can see all four episodes in a row as they were meant to be seen. If you've not yet become a member at BillWhittle.com, you can do that at that same website uh, by clicking the Become a Member button. We'll provide a link in the description below. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.